Carefully evaluate before investing. This is your Real Estate Today on News. Hello and welcome to the show, Your Real Estate Today. Paul Jamison here, your host, and so glad that you're with us. Thank you for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. I hope wherever you are, you are happy, safe, and enjoying the Saturday, and we're glad you're with us. If you're a first-time listener, this show is about real estate, anything having to do with it, talking about it, hanging with it, being with it. We want to talk to you about it. So if that is the case, then you're in the right place. And we're glad you're with us. So here's what we're going to do today. Um, in this first segment, we're going to have Sandy Dickinson give us our usual uh, mortgage update. And then Trent Haston from the Roby Companies is here. And he's going to talk a little bit about the Make-A-Wish Foundation and what they've got going on there. So we're excited to hear from him. So stay with us. We've got a lot going on today and we're glad you're with us. So I'm going to start as I always do. What in the world did I learn this week? Yes, an old man can actually learn something. All right. So by mid-2021, by mid-2021, that'd be middle of next year, 50% of the workforce should actually return to work. They got to go back to work. No more home working. 50% are going to be called back. You know what? I don't believe that. Just saying. I think it's going to be much smaller than that. I think companies are going to figure out that, hey, wait, wait a minute. We're in this office tower up here and we're air conditioning it. We're providing them a water cooler. And we're providing them AC and heat, and internet, and computers and all this kind of stuff. Why are we paying for that? We can get our employees to pay for it. So we're just going to let them stay home. They're working more from home anyway. Who knows when they can't sleep at night, they go to their computers and are working anyway. So I don't think 50% of the workforce is going to go back next year, but that's what the statistics say. So we'll see who's right. It'll be me. All right, next. Negotiations. I think you all believe negotiations are not done well by intimidation. So the very first thing I learned this week is don't call the baby ugly if you want to negotiate. Here's what I mean. So I got a call from an agent on one of my listings. First question, do you have any offers? Why, yes, we do. All right. They said, okay. Well, do you know that the paint is chipping off the ceiling in the bathroom, that the carpet has a stain on it in the living room, that there's some wood rot outside on the soffits, and you know, the neighbor next door is just so sloppy that it really just brings down the value of that house? You know what I said? Why are you even calling me if you don't like it? Well, we have great interest in it. And I said, well, it sure doesn't sound like it. <laughs> so here's the reality. If you want to negotiate, if you want to write an offer, if you want a first impression, don't just jump up and say, that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen, but I love it. People don't, don't do well. Do you think real estate's an emotional business? Uh, yeah. What if they raised all their children there? What if their marks are there from as they were growing up on the door frame? What if that stain in the other room was when the baby had its first vomit? I mean, who knows what it is, but it's going to be emotional. Don't do it. Or a beer stain from when somebody won the Super Bowl. You never know. So don't disrupt and call the baby ugly. There you go. Learned that this week. Learned that every week. All right. Also, price matters. But if you're in a multiple offer situation in the real estate business, the total package matters. And Sandy's going to, we're going to talk about some of that today with Sandy Dickinson with Summit Funding. The whole package matters. You know, in many multiple offer situations, we're not always taking the highest price. We're looking at the due diligence period or the time the house is off the market. We're looking at who the lender is, quote unquote, Sandy Dickinson Summit Funding most of the time. We're looking at who's doing the home inspection. Sorry, folks, who the other agent is on the other side. From past experience, when you got the gray hair I've got, you know who gets the deals done and who doesn't. And 
What are the terms? You know, do they want to close in six years or six days? You know, those are the things that can make or break a deal. Money is always important. So make sure you do that. And I will tell you, as older sellers put their house on the market, what do you think they love the most when it comes to offers? They love cash. You know why? Because they know cash works. They don't always understand loans. They don't always understand the terms of loans. They don't understand FHV, FHA, VA, RSVP, USDA, whatever. They understand cash and they like it better. So if you've got an older seller and you can pay cash, go back and refi it later. Sorry, Sandy. Go back and refi it later and bring cash to the table. All right, last before we jump in and do the mortgage update, we're starting an investment club that will be virtual for right now. I'm gonna limit it. We're gonna meet once a month. If you're interested, either you have an investment, a, a piece of property, you wanna make investment, you wanna learn how to invest in real estate and have 75,000 in liquid assets to do that, or you have a piece of property identified that you really wanna learn more about. You can do this by emailing me, paul at myjamesonhomes.com or call us at 846-DUNN-846-3663. All right, so I also just wanna let you know that the market is good and things are strong and we're in a great place. And as you all know, I own Jameson Realty, Jameson Property Management and Jameson Property Investments. All three of those companies right now are very, very vibrant and we're looking for inventory. So if you're thinking about selling, you know, this is truly the time. But I'd like to take the next couple of minutes and introduce to you Trent Haston from the Roby family of companies. Uh, Trent, you're doing some really good things with some young folks these days. Right? Yeah, no, we are. And, and excited about what you're doing on the show. Uh, excited about the real estate market. I think we're in a great region of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, Bring it on, folks from the West and Northeast. Come on down. Yeah, that's we'll, right. We'll teach you how to talk better. Uh, but yeah, our, our firm is uh, the Roby family. Andrew Roby has been in business 70 years for a third generation family business. And 13 years ago, we started uh, a cornhole tournament called Pitching for Wishes. And it benefits the Make a Wish Foundation of Central and Western North Carolina. Um, it's utilizing the resources that we're so blessed to have, the vendors, the subcontractors that we do business with and purchase from, and then utilizes our customer base that are so we're so fortunate that hire us to do work. So our model is how do we add value to our vendors and customers and, and put them together to, to create a win-win for something local, something where the money stays in the community. And we have chosen over the last 13 years, uh, the Make-A-Wish Foundation of Central and Western North Carolina. If you listen to our show this on Sundays, At Home with Roby show, we, 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 we're leading up to our upcoming, this year we're not able to do the pitching for wishes, but it's our 13th annual due to COVID. We thought it responsible not to get 500 to 1,000 people together and have a cornhole tournament. So we're going to walk 28.3 miles on uh, oh Friday, gosh. November the 7th. And our, our sponsors are pledging donations to the Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, for us to go walk that. And we're going to touch in some form or fashion, everybody that gave money, we're going to walk by their business or walk by a job that they're working on. And, and the goal is uh, to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars to go directly to grant wishes for children with life-threatening illnesses. That's wonderful. The Roby family of companies um, and the at Roby show uh, Sunday at 10, right? Uh, Sunday nine, nine. nine. Sunday at nine. Sunday at 9 a.m. You want to listen to these guys. And actually, I'm a customer of y'all's. I'm you. glad to do it. Y'all do a great job. And we're excited about... Um, things ahead that we have together and looking forward to the Make-A-Wish uh, event that you're having on the November the 7th. That's right. November Friday, the 7th. November the 7th. And thank you for having us. I look forward to the future together as well. Sunday at nine, the At Home at Roby show. Thank you guys. And we'll be right back to show your real estate today here on News Talk 1110 99.3 WBT. Stay right with us. 
Welcome back to Show Your Real Estate Today. You're on News Talk 1110 wbt I'm Paul Jamison, your host, owner of the Jamison family of companies here with Sandy Dickinson with Summit Funding. We're talking about Sandy's picky, invasive requests that are necessary in order to get a mortgage loan and the reasons why. And it is helpful. I, I didn't know a lot of the things that Sandy's been sharing so far about why they do certain things the way they do them. I guess, you know, um, as we referenced before, um, the pendulum from 2008 has kind of swung the other way, but it's still changing. And I think it's gotten a lot better in the last couple of years. Don't you, Sandy? Yeah, it definitely has. We still, we've still we gotten more programs back, like the bank statement programs and the jump up. And thanks to COVID, we're not having to validate tax returns at the moment um, because it's a nightmare to try to get them with the shutdown of a lot of the IRS offices, mm -hmm. I guess, or they couldn't get to their computers. Well, that's so true. That's we got good. that going that's for good. us. One more, one more easier step to get to the finish line. <laughs> All right. So um, I already gave my pay stubs. Why do you need more? Yeah, so currently with the COVID, we have to verify that you're still working and that your pay has not decreased all the way up to the date of closing. So we get, a, there's a lot of aggravation that number one, they shorten the time frame on how long documents are good for. They used to be 120 days, now they're good for 60 days. Um, so bank statements have the date of closing. So. It, we're scrambling at the end of every closing to gather. If you're self-employed, we have to have an updated yes, P&L and, and bank statement for your business. So it's um it's a lot of work, but um we have to make sure you got to make your payments. Yeah, and and I and I, I get that. I mean, these are different times, and they do require some different things. I, I do understand that. Mm -hmm. I remember when I did a couple of refis with you here recently. They wanted P&Ls sent i think just a few days before we closed so up to the that date i do remember that yeah uh -huh. okay. all right you have here noted and you touched on it before the blank pages on the bank statement um that one you, you mentioned earlier yeah bank statements divorce decrees um we have to always have all pages some people or some people just try to give me the first two pages of the tax return we also have to have all the pages of the federal return and the mm -hmm. statements we don't need worksheets, we don't need state, but um, anything that you give us, if it says one through five or one through 15 or one of two, including uh, social security benefit statements, we have to have all the pages. Um, we just, um, they're, they're not compromising. Okay. Well, that, that. I guess that makes sense too, including uh, investment statements and things like that that may come. Okay. okay. Right, all right. right. This, one, this one, I can't wait to hear your answer on, all right? I have money at home in my safe, under my mattress, behind my wall, outside in the backyard, buried. Why can't I use it? It's money, for goodness sake. I'll put it in the bank first if you want me to. I know. <laughs> well, this comes from the anti-money laundering rules. So I've had several people that thought they were doing amazing by taking their money out and keeping it in the safe as they saved it so they wouldn't spend it. Um, and then they're like, okay, I have $50,000 and I'm ready to buy. And I'm like, oh, we can't use that money. It has to be seasoned in an account at least for two months. We have to know where all the money comes from um, so that we know it's not borrowed or from some illegal source or that, or that you're not money laundering. So we have to... Um, have it in the account and we have to know where your money comes from as far as um, 401ks or right. paychecks. And, and I think Sandy and, and you'll correct me whatever it is, we have like to, we everyone have to does when I um, try to, to remember something way back. But I think um, you had said that they like to source money that's what over $2,500 or something like that? Um, it's different for FHA and conventional. For conventional, Anything over 50% of your monthly gross income. I don't know where they got that from, but we have to source that. Okay. Um, on FHA, I think it's more than 1% of the loan amount. So it's different for each type of loan program. Um, if it looks 
um, odd to an underwriter, even if it's not within those rules, they have discretion to ask, you know, hey, this doesn't look right for your income. Yeah, and um, when and I your was refining basic cash uh, loan, loan. we sold a car to Carvana. So there was a deposit of several thousand dollars in there. And they're like, where did that money come from? Um, so I had to show that I sold the car and that's where the deposit came from. So it was the Carvana yeah. request. And if you sell a car to an individual, then the documentation gets even crazier because we have to have the bill of sale. We have to have proof of what the car was worth. We have to show the transfer of money. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty intense. Well, there's a, before you buy a home, don't sell your car to an individual. <laughs> okay. All right. So why are they asking about reoccurring withdrawals and large deposits in my account? So the deposits we just went over, the withdrawals is something that um, we haven't, you know, that's come about over the last couple uh -huh. of years. We used to not look at withdrawals so much, but what we're looking for is undisclosed debt. So if they see the same amount of money coming out at the same time of the month, every month, then they're going to ask what that is. Because what if you, what if you have a loan that you didn't tell us about? And this includes IRS payments. A lot of people are on IRS payments, um, and we would have to include that you qualified for the loan. We want to make sure that we know what all your income and debts are so that we're not putting you in a position to where you can't make the payment. What about alimony and child support? Um, yes, if you're paying it, um, we have to know, and we have to count that against you. If you're, if you're getting it, you don't have to disclose it. Um, but if we see that money going in and it's a large amount, we're probably going to be. Yeah. And, the, and it would also be a clue that we have to get divorce decrees and separation papers because we have to see if there's any contingent liabilities um, from the separation. Mm -hmm. Like a large payment due or something at a certain right. time, that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Okay. Then why do they want a P&L if they're not going to use the income reflected on it? Um, they want to, they can't use it because it's not verifiable, but we want to see basically that the business is in the same, same, um, income and debt situation from the previous year. So if we see a big declination of income, that's going to be a problem. Um, if we see increases, we like it, but, um, we, they definitely scrutinize those and people don't put a lot of time in them usually. Um, if they're small businesses, and some of them don't know how to prepare P and L, so sometimes we have to educate them on that. Um, but it's it's important that uh, it shows similar um, income yeah, from the I previous year. I remember doing that for you also. So my student loans are deferred. Why do you need me to get payment information for them? I think this goes back to the 2008, 2009 as well. <laughs> Um, we used to be if they were deferred for 12 months, we never had to count a payment. Um, but I think what they found out is that once those people have a lot of school debt now, and once those payments hit, it was a cause for a lot of delinquencies. So on, um, on conventional Fannie Mae, we can count income-based payments. We just have to have the documentation. On FHA, we have to count 1% of the balance, which sometimes is pretty steep. And for Freddie Mac, we count a half percent of the balance. So it's different for every loan type as well. Um, and for VA, we take the payment, 5% of the balance, and we divide it by 12. They all come up with their own scenarios, but um, we definitely have to count some things for those because we don't want them not to have a payment and you're living on the edge and all of a sudden now you have a big payment. Yeah. Okay. Well, in the last 30 seconds, I was a W-2 employee, and now they pay me 1099. I make more money now, so why can't you use my income? I can't use it because all of a sudden you've become self-employed. And when you're self-employed, you can write off expenses, and you have expenses that the company doesn't pay. Um, and so we have no history of that. And therefore, we can't use that income because we don't know what the resulting net adjusted gross income is going to be. Right. So let me net this out. 
Sandy. So we've got all these things going on behind the scenes, right? Right. So the, the advantage of working with you is although these 12 things sound very complicated and cumbersome, you walk people through the process and make it easy. Right. And we try to tell you everything up front. So there's no surprises because there's nothing worse than starting that way, not knowing. And then all of a sudden we're asking for a million more things. Right. Because it really doesn't feel complicated. It's not easy. You got to gather a lot of stuff, but I think your group and your team really help help make you and walk you all the way through. I think that's the benefit of working with someone from me. That's in my, my opinion. All right, so we'll be yeah, back thank you. to show you real estate today. Paul Jamison, Sandy Dickinson, stay with us. We've got more to talk about. We're, we're, we're here, so, so don't go away. <laughs> we'll be right back. All right, so welcome back to the show your real estate today on this Saturday. And uh, man, time just to, it continues to move so quickly. And we're excited to be with you. I'm Paul Jamison, your host, here with Sandy Dickinson with Summit Funding. Uh, Sandy did a real good wrap up of kind of the expectations and making sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed in the loan process. I mean, it's just how it is. So rather than get frustrated about it, know what they need, know how they need it, and let them walk you through it. And that's the advantage of working with Summit Funding, and especially with Sandy and her team. They walk you through. So I, I wanted you to be aware of some things that you need to know as a seller, that you need to know as a seller, um, that we make sure and communicate so that when we get to the closing table, you're not going, huh? We, so it's the anti, huh? What? I didn't know that conversation. And we try to make that as easy as we can for you. One of the first things we do, if in, in, and a lot of people ask us to do this, they go, well, if it sells for this, what am I going to get when I go to the closing table? How much money am I going to get? I hear it all the time. What's my bottom line? What's my net? So we have a form called a seller net sheet. And on that seller net sheet, we can give you multiple three scenarios that says if it sells for this, one price or this price or this price. So we, we take three different prices and then we calculate the commissions, we calculate the attorney fees, we get your payoff, we put in an estimated amount for if they're gonna ask for repairs, we try to give you, you know, home warranty, um, tax stamps if you're in the great state of Mecklenburg County or Union County or York County or wherever, uh, you know, all the fees that we see on a typical closing we try to give you, again, that's called a seller net sheet. So want to make sure you get kind of that range of it's going to be between here and here. And, and that's a good information to know, especially if you're looking at other houses. How much money will I have? Right? So it's an important thing to ask for and don't, don't be shy about asking for it. I've done tons of them. Um, I can... I can easily do any of that. You know, you have things that people don't understand or know about um, for even purchases like title insurance. They always ask, well, why are there two title insurance policies? Well, you got one for the owner and one for the bank if you're borrowing money. Um, so there are just different things that may come up that may be an expense to you. So it's always kind of good to know what you're going to get. All right. Also, one of the things, especially in the older homes that I like to do is I like to do a pre-inspection. I'll have Preston Sandlin with Home Inspection Carolina come out and do an inspection on the home, um, especially if you're on a crawl space. And that's just how it is. Crawl spaces are, if you haven't been in there or haven't had it looked at, especially in the older homes, you know, there could be a problem under there. We want to make sure that once we go under contract that we don't get any surprises related to that. So the second area is kind of the pre-sale costs. If you have an older home or if you haven't, you've let your termite bond go, have Marty Ivy come out and do a termite inspection. We want when we go under contract for there to be as few surprises as possible. Other pre-sale costs we talk about up front as well, like staging if you want to get the home staged. Um, 
Some people don't wash the windows for 15 years or so. You know, we may want to get the windows washed um, and, and done. We may want to have a deep clean. We may want to get the stove cleaned or throw it away and get a new stove. You know, we may want to replace some things or do some things. So, and we look at the costs and the returns on those costs and how they're going to impact the sale. For example, I've got a house getting ready to go on the market. The paint, I think, is original to them when they bought it about 20 to 25 years ago. And they've hung pictures and they've scuffed furniture and they've got marks on it. And when they empty the house, there's marks on it. And, you know, the, the trim is just uh, faded and lived in. And, you know, I, I knew to paint the whole house with the exception of the ceiling, it was going to be about $5,800. Well, that's money you will get back in that sale and it's money well spent. So you look at those expenses and you make sure that you talk through those. Those are kind of the pre-sale types of things. All right, you know, staging a home, there's this NAR says it's 300 to 600 for the design consultation for staging and five to $600 per room. Um, that's their figures. I mean, I have stagers that I work with and it really just depends on how long and how many and what rooms. So you get a quote for that up front. All right. Um, also, you know, during the sale, you know, they have a provision in the North Carolina contract when you go under contract that says this contract and the signing of this contract means the house is being sold as is. Okay, we all know the, the Webster definition of as is, it's as is. Well, in our market, that's not how it is. I've seen very little what I call as is. During the due diligence period or the layaway period, they're going to most likely ask for some type of repair or concession. That's what that period is for. It's a discovery period to examine the home and put all your ducks in a row to purchase it. So that is where that is negotiated. So during the sale, as is, is hard to do. And I see very little of it. I've seen it a few times, honestly, but I don't see it very often. So just know as a seller, you got to build in some costs for some repairs because they're going to ask for it. It just happens. Okay. Think about moving and moving cost and things into your next house, like compare moving cost, you know, an in-state move, the average is about uh, $2,300 and out of state move is about $4,300. I don't know where these numbers come from, but um, you know, there's got to be a cost. And if you're transitioning and you haven't bought another house, what I tell people is put your stuff in those pod things. Uh, there are several companies that have them, not just pods themselves. So this is not a commercial for them. But you load it in one time, you go stay at an Airbnb or something until you find another house or an executive stay storage thingy, and you unload it one time. So it's the easiest way to do it, I think. So there you go. All right. So one other thing you might want to know if it's not your primary residence is what are the taxes going to be? Make sure you talk to a CPA if you have capital gains on a piece of property and know what those taxes look like before you make the sale. I'm not a CPA. Please consult your CPA for more information because they need to tell you what that tax consequence is gonna look like. And then last, have pan, has the pandemic changed the cost of a home? Right now, yes, it has caused good demand as, as homes become more in demand and as people move in this area. That's what I think. So we're gonna finish the turnoffs though next week. We're gonna finish that up anyway. So Sandy, if people want to uh, get a loan or a refi, how do they get you? Call my mobile, 704-577-0144. If we can assist you buying, selling, investing, 
we would love to talk to you or managing a property for you, you can call us at 846-DUNN, 846-3663, the Jameson Realty Family of Companies. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. And we'll talk to you all, friends, next week. Be safe. Enjoy the show your real estate today. God bless you all. We'll talk to you next week.